Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Research Roundtable. Every month, we take on a different topic with some of the leading minds. And of course, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Our topic is breast cancer-related lymphedema. We always have the amazing Karens on our panel, Dr. Karen Herbst, who is the Chief Medical Officer for Lympha Press, Karen Ashworth, Certified Lymphedema Therapist and an expert on lymphedema, pneumatic compression, fibrosis. So we're always honored to have those two as our anchors. Our special firepower tonight comes from two folks that basically left the NLN conference and ended up logging on to be with us tonight. And we're so grateful. We have a clinician and a patient perspective, both coming to us from Missy Baylor. Missy is the CEO and owner of Lymphatic Solutions. She's a well-respected clinician. Missy, we're so glad to have you here with us tonight. Thank you. And Leslie Bell, who is one of the experts when it comes to breast cancer-related lymphedema, also flew in to be with us tonight. We know that you are going to have many questions and we will navigate those. Please put them in the Q&A. Let us know you're here in chat. And without further ado, I'm going to yield to Dr. Karen Herbst to get things started. Well, welcome everybody. And it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and we are really uh, very lucky and I'm, I'm honored and I'm sure Karen is too, to have our guest tonight. And I am really looking forward to learning more about breast lymphedema and how it affects not only the breast, but the rest of the body. So I don't know if you want to just begin with going through some of your slides, Leslie. And while you're doing that, Missy, can you just give the audience a little bit of the backstory of how you came to this point in your journey where clinician and then all of a sudden patient? Yes. Um, my diagnosis was uh, done in February of 2023. I did a self-exam and found, you know, a change and immediately went to get a mammogram and immediately found out that going on with stage 2A, but it had not spread. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones, and um, the decision was made to do chemotherapy, which I did from March through June, and then we did a lumpectomy. This was on the right side. I did lumpectomy on the right and a reduction left on the uh, reduction of lift on the left, and then uh, after surgery in July, I did radiation. Um, I call it radiation light because I only had to do three and a half weeks as opposed to a full four weeks or six weeks, so... I did do radiation and the whole time I just was kind of kicking and screaming saying, I don't want radiation. I don't want radiation because I know what it does to breast tissue. So, but they say, well, this is the standard of care. This is what we're going to do. I'm like, okay, let's, let's just go. Let's, let's roll. Let's get it done. And, and it's been done and I've been clear for a year or so. Um, and and I do have residual, um, some residual lymphedema, breast edema, trunkal edema. Um, I got all my tools lined up, all my things in place, my compression bras and my you know, other tools to help me manage. Um, knowing what needed to be done prior to doing it, um, I, I might have been my own therapist. Well, we are all, there was a collective cheer that went up in the audience when you said it's been a year and you're clear. That is the best news possible. And when this whole topic came up, Karen Ashworth has said, you need Leslie Bell and Missy Baylor to be on this panel. Why did you say that, Karen Ashworth? Well, I'm a little biased because they're both my buds. But I'm also here to say that um, each of these two extraordinary therapists and women are so experienced, so gifted, so talented, and both of them are great at thinking outside of the box. So it was really easy when you put out the cry, who should we have? There was no question in my mind. And I feel like we've really got a dream team tonight. So thank you. Thank you both of you for saying yes. So away we go. Lympha Press is so honored to host this panel tonight. Thank you all who have mentioned that you're out there and logging on. And we'd love to hear what some of your slides have to say, Leslie. Okay, well, I thought I'd start out with a couple of pictures. 
because there's an awful lot of information out there about arm lymphedema. We talk about lymphedema. It's luckily it's being the, the awareness has increased dramatically, but I think that sometimes patients who are the quote lucky ones that like Missy, they don't even know that they're supposed to look for it. They think that maybe, you know, I had surgery or and or radiation and treatment. And so, you know, this is just what has to happen. And and a lot of women don't complain. I mean, the the average time that it takes for a woman to complain about a medical problem is actually quite a bit longer than a men, than men most of the time. So Anyways, but I just wanted to show a couple of pictures to start out with, and you can see that picture um, up on the left side of your screen, and you can see those those dents, those um, linear dents going down the breast. You can also see the misshapen breast right there. And you know, when they take out a lump, and um, or or even sometimes it's a partial mastectomy, the tissue or the breast should be actually smaller. And so, if it's actually larger than it was before, then that's a first clue. Um, and, and it's uncomfortable and it can be painful. So anyways, I'm looking forward to sharing some of these slides with you, I'm gonna advance it. So like I said, arm lymphedema is obvious, but sometimes the total picture is debilitating. And so sometimes under the patient's clothes, there's some real changes that have happened to their tissues and their skin. And some people get breast and chest wall lymphedema and or scarring and fibrosis and arm lymphedema, and that's really an unfortunate trifecta. So, we need to remember that when the sentinel nodes are removed um, or the nodes are removed, if they need to take more than just the sentinel nodes, that that is dramatically affecting the drainage from the breast tissue. So I call it the pink elephant in the room. There's just a real disparity in recognition in terms of you know what patients are experiencing and when they discuss it and um, maybe even what their doctors are asking them because truly physicians don't like to talk about too many um, complications until it's a complication. So I know that you know around the country, you know the information that might be given to patients preoperatively is not always as maybe comprehensive as some of us lymphedema therapists. And granted, you know we are preaching to our choir, you know think it should be. And so some of these patients don't know to actually discuss it with their doctors. So you know, I would like everybody to understand during Breast Cancer Awareness Month that, um, you know, breast and chest wall edema is probably as prevalent, maybe even a little more prevalent than arm edema is at this point in time. You know, everybody that has uh, any treatment to their chest wall, whether it's surgery or radiation, is going to have post-treatment effects. That doesn't necessarily mean it's lymphedema, but if it persists, if it's painful, um, or it doesn't go away in a, in a, some you know reasonable amount of time, then that might be starting to get congested in the chest wall. And the sooner we are able to get that congestion better or move it out of those lymphatic vessels, um, the better chances our patients have of maybe not having a continued problem. So um, we're hoping that this is gonna help people um, understand it and raise some awareness. So when we do these sentinel node biopsies, I mean, they do a very good job at trying to put the dye in and then they follow that dye and they try to not take extra lymph nodes. But even sometimes those the lymph nodes that are associated with the sentinel node biopsy, they can actually impede lymphatic flow from that area of the breast. So, and the breast actually drains in a couple of ways. It can drain over to the sternal nodes and it drains up into the axilla. So when the axilla is affected by the surgery, um, that can change the way that the breasts actually drain. So as I call it the, luck, the lucky ones, um, you know, patients that are lucky enough to keep their breast or lucky enough to have minimal, maybe minimal uh, treatment for their breast cancer, they may not complain. They just may really feel very fortunate that they're here and that they're not having to do more aggressive treatment, but that doesn't mean that they don't deserve care. And when they start getting some breast swelling, they may not know that there are treatments for that, that they can, that there are compression, compression bras that are made specifically for patients with breast edema. And those aren't necessarily in a department store. So they may not know that they can go to a medical supply store of some sort and look at some of the different options that are available to these patients. So. Um, I just want everybody to know that whether you're a lucky one or maybe someone who had to have more aggressive treatment, 
that there is there is care. And I think it's very reasonable to establish a relationship with a lymphedema therapist very early on. You know, in the, in the best possible scenario, we would have preoperative assessments of these patients or prospective surveillance, we call it. And that gives us the option to take preoperative measurements, um, to educate the patient a little bit so that then they know when it's time to come and talk to either their doctor or their or the lymphedema therapist if they can establish a relationship. And the other thing is the therapist is not just going to help them with lymphatic issues. We're going to help them with range of motion and strength. And you know there are certain things that get affected during these treatments. So you know one of them is that there's a nerve that goes down the back of our shoulder underneath our shoulder blade that can sometimes get affected in terms of um, how it how it sends information, it can be a little sluggish. And sometimes our rotator cuff um, can get affected. It's not damaged, but it can get affected and it can increase in um, weakness in the shoulder. And so there's a high incidence of shoulder dysfunction three years out of uh, breast cancer treatment, um, having to partly do with that, or maybe partly to do with any kind of scar tissue that might be present that's limiting the motion. And sometimes we think we get our arms over our head, but it's not equal. You know, you may have one like this and one that's that's less, and that's definitely um, a good reason to see a therapist and make sure that you're maximizing the rehabilitation after you have this treatment. The incidence of breast edema is, you know, it's there. Um, it's higher if you measure it with ultrasound. Um, mammography will sometimes pick it up, but it's not usually what they're looking for in mammography. Um, so the just this is just a, a, a slide that I just want people to be aware that, you know, people are looking at it and, you know, we want to make sure that we're looking at those risk factors. So here's another problem that happens with it. Um, you can get something called pot to orange and it comes from looking, that name comes from actually looking at an, an orange peel where you see those little um, dots on the orange peel, but it happens because of the inversion of the hair follicles on the breast. And that is when the breast starts to swell, um, that, that hair follicle will invert a little bit and you'll get a puffiness around that follicle. And so that's kind of what it looks like right there. And you can see the, the picture on the left side of your screen. You can just look at that breast and see that it's larger and more heavy than um, obviously the other side. Now, true, we do not have girls that are all exactly the same prior to. So having an awareness of the size of your breasts and the textures of your breasts before treatment is something to maybe take into account, but they still wouldn't look like this pre-operatively. So pot orange is something that we look for. Uh, and despite the good aesthetic results that patients often get, there's still you know an incidence of breast edema up to five years following surgery, and it can be pretty high. And it might be mild, it might be mild, or it could be severe, but it's, it's, it's definitely there. I mean, talking to one very well-known um, surgeon, uh, I asked him how many of his patients get breast edema, and he said, oh, all of them. And it is true. So following surgery, every surgical, um, every surgical operation has edema afterwards. And so we want to make sure that it doesn't linger for a long time. There's really no correlation with um, the level of node dissection, meaning whether it was in the axilla, up towards the neck, underneath the clavicle, the bra cup size, or the tumor location. Um, but it does have something to do with body mass index. So sometimes if we are a little heavier, that increases the risk of um, breast lymphedema. And, and, and maybe a little bit with chemo treatments and hormonal treatments, but again, that just also might indicate that the that the cancer may have been a little more advanced and so they needed a little more therapy. So that might increase the risk as well. I have uh, something to say about that anti-hormone therapy. I had a patient who had breast cancer, had a lumpectomy and the, didn't have any um, real issues with breast swelling, but she got swelling in her legs. And so we just increased her manual lymphatic drainage therapy. She was on tamoxifen and um, just, she was a little bit more aggressive with exercise, compression, and then the MLD and um, eventually got off the hormone, anti-hormone therapy and um, did very well and then could kind of back down off of being aggressive. So I think, um, it, I don't think a lot of providers know that anti-hormone 
therapy can lead to the development of edema. And it can lead to, in my opinion, it can lead to edema in any part of the body, even outside the breast. That's true. And certain forms of chemotherapy, particularly the taxane-based chemotherapies, can um, create uh, lymphedema in the legs as well as the arms. So that's not a hugely well-known fact. Yeah. Well, and, and again, that, that also just, also the body's just under more stress, just increases the stress. And then there's those patients that might have a genetic propensity to edema. And then these treatments actually just uncover that or bring that out a little bit more. So thank you very much. So down back to another slide um, that, that shows us watersheds. And I'm not sure how many of our patients on this um, seminar right now or how many are therapists, but for those people that don't understand watersheds, I thought I would bring that up. And I just wanna show you that when we look at the way the, the lymphatic fluid drains into the major lymph node beds, the major lymph node beds would be here in the axilla and then some along the center of the sternum right here. But you can see these green lines going. It kind of, I always say all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> and Rome is right, is really the big Rome is right here. So if you're removing lymph nodes, obviously, and it can't get through, then obviously the chest swells. And we see chest or chest and breast swelling. It's not just the breast. We'll see it across the back. We'll see it down the lower part of the trunk right here under the breast. Um, we'll, we can see it in many different places, but those watersheds definitely um, are trying to do their job. And if they've been impaired, they can't. So that the things that we see are, you know, from the scarring, that might be limiting some of the movement of fluid, um, the fibrosis or, or thickening of, of the tissues, which happens when fluid sits around for too long, it starts to get a little bit thicker, it starts to grow extra collagen, and it's sort of like moving jello through space. And so it, it, it creates a, a restriction. Sometimes we'll see pitting edema. Pitting edema means that if you push in on that tissue, it leaves a little dent. So that would not be a normal reason. That would be a very good reason to go see a, a physical therapist. But again, then bra constriction, you know, sometimes people's bras don't fit the same following breast cancer treatment and it might be too tight. I mean, I've had some patients who come in in a bra that they probably had since high school and um, there's some pretty significant dents that are already there. I mean, have you ever seen patients with a dent up here in their upper trapezius? Mm -hmm. You know, that just that pre existing dent or scarring that um, may be present may also contribute to the limitation of fluid motion. <clears throat> Leslie, I have a question for you. We've been talking about the removal of lymph nodes and the increased risk of edema, but could the trauma of the surgery itself cause edema if it damaged Absolutely. a particular lymphatic pathway? Absolutely, and that's what I mean. 100% of these patients are gonna come out of treatment with swelling. If they had surgery, they're gonna come out with swelling. But if you had your ankle had surgery, it would have swelling. If you have your knee, you know, surgerized, it'll have swelling. So that's what I mean. But there are certain predisposing problems that will then exacerbate it. Then you add on some of these chemotherapies or you add the dents in the shoulder like I'm adding right here. So what we're really looking for is swelling that starts to change. So is it a puppy swelling? Is it a thick swelling? Is it got pitting edema to it? Is it resolving? I mean, when should swelling start to resolve after treatment? Probably within four to six weeks for most patients. So if it's not really resolving well in some reasonable amount of time, you know, it's time to go talk to your doctor and or your therapist and find out if they see any other reason that it should be persisting and would it get better? And those of us that are lymphedema therapists, I think I can speak for the, the three of us that are on this panel here, we will all tell you that we should probably be doing lymphatic drainage like the day after surgery or the week after surgery, just to promote movement of that extra fluid. And it, makes a, it can make a big difference. That is certainly something that I, when I have the opportunity to see my patients preoperatively, you know, just for, I have them do it if they have ankle surgery. So, you know, lymphatic drainage is an unbelievable tool. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing in how it can move fluid. So, so yes, everybody gets fluid, but it's how long does it take to go away? Did that answer the question, Karen? Yes, thank okay. you. And does other Karen, do you have anything to add to that?
Sorry, I was muted. Um, no, I think you said it all. I, I, I love, love, love your illustrations. I think that, um, you know, a picture says a thousand words and you have a gift for finding great images that really convey what we need to know. Uh, well, so one of the things that I'd like to bring up here is that when we look at these water, oops, let me go back. When we look at these watersheds, they come across the waste right here. And you can just imagine that if you've got a big tight, a lot of tightness right here, how that's going to maybe make the fluid stay into the breast. The other thing to consider is that a breast is a pendulous sack of adipose tissue and glandular tissue that does not have a pump in it. So when we look at a leg that has, a, has surgery or an arm that has surgery, there's a muscle pump surrounding that joint that helps that fluid to move out. In the case of a breast, we do not have a muscle pump there. And so the more pendulous the breast, which may have, you know, that correlates with um, increased BMI, but the more pendulous that breast is, the more it's going to maintain that fluid unless we lift it up, which is why a compression bra, and I developed the, com the Belize compression bra mm, probably 22 years ago now, because really what needs to happen is that breast needs to be lifted and, and compressed not squished, but it needs to be held in place so that the fluid can drain off the sides of the chest wall and you don't, you're reducing the amount of pendulous tissue that's coming down. And I think that's how we get to um, reduce the fluid um, from building up in that area. Leslie, I don't want to get you off topic too much, but we did have a question from the audience. Sandra Willis is struggling with treating male breast cancer patients. Any suggestions for male-friendly compression that really addresses the scar lines? Um, there, well, there's a number of different types of products that though. Certainly, if it's a male, and, and this can happen, I mean, it, it doesn't matter male or female. If this tissue is affected by all these treatments we've just been talking about, they have the opportunity to swell um, or get thick or get scarred. So probably... And maybe Karen or or um, Missy might have some brand names, but something that's a compressive shirt of some sort. And there are a few companies out there that make it. I mean, in, before some of those compressive shirts came out, we just would put some of the males in the bra that we developed and just use the very flat front. We have an AB that's very, very flat in the front to get it. You know, one of the things that we want is we want it to come up high in the armpits. Um, to, because that's where it fills up is kind of high up into the armpit. So yes, there are a number one. And I think Wary's has a couple of good tank tops, right, Karen? They do, yeah. And you know, also sometimes men prefer to go with athletic compression because yeah. it looks a little sportier and non-medical. So I send a lot of my guys to the sporting goods store because it's, it's a thing now, um, sports compression. Yeah, aren't Jennifer we just wrote in the chat that Under Armour makes a compression shirt and they sure do. And there's a number of other brands out there too. Yeah. So I think just getting them in some compression is a, just a really valuable tool for them. Yeah. So here's a patient who has lymphedema and lipedema who had breast cancer. And so she has all of this looser connective tissue and some, you know, collection of, of adipose tissue. And so this, this breast is very pendulous now because she had an implant put in, but you can just see the rolls. And these creases right here actually contribute to the, um, the fluid getting, getting stuck in that area. So, you know, when you look at what's happening over on this side right here in a compressive product, you can see how we can hold that in. And then it has the ability to move up, which it's trying to do towards the axilla. So adding compression to a patient who has this excess. So really remember to look at your patient's backs, to look at their sides. And I run my fingers down their sides. And those of us that have been feeling edema for a bazillion years, all we have to do is kind of touch it and we go, oh yeah, there it is. But you, know, you can feel the tissue texture changes. So even if the patient doesn't have an enormous amount of swelling that's persistent, and sometimes it comes and goes too. So don't be surprised if it's not always there but run your fingers down the side of that trunk and feel that tissue and how much thickness or change from side to side are you aware of? Here's another uh, picture of a patient who's got a temporary edema. So this is a patient who, I don't think she has true lymphedema, which generally means that that's been persistent for more than three months. 
and not getting better. But this is a post-operative post edema, and you can see this scar right here, and you can see the buildup of fluid. And, you know, this is like six months out of radiation, and she still has this. Um, her, her breast is a little bit heavier and a little bit bigger, but, you know, we treated her, got her better, and time helps too. So it's not to say that time doesn't always heal things as well. But we were able to, with a number of the types of treatments that we do, I use lasers, I use uh, negative pressure, I use myofascial techniques, I use tape. I mean, I know that my colleagues also use that stuff. Um, that loosened up this scar because that six months later, you can see that was still harboring fluid retention right here. And look how much better she looks with treatment. And the breast is still a little bit swollen, but it's not firm and she doesn't have that hump on the top there. And none of these treatments stand alone. I mean, the one thing that we have as, as uh, therapists who treat this stuff is a lot of tools on our box. And I always say we have exceptionally high upsides and very low downsides. So the good news is you can try it. If it doesn't change it, you know, you can move on to another type of treatment. But really our gold standards of treatment are, you know, compression and mm -hmm. um, myofascial treatment. And then there's those patients with the persistent swelling that do very well with pumps. And I would really like everybody to think, think about what's going to make this patient's quality of life better. You know, if they're really struggling with persistent chest wall edema and persistent arm edema, and they would, they would, their life would be easier if they had a compression pump to help them move that out on a regular basis. You know, I really believe that we need to be thinking about that for our patients. What's going to make their life better? Leslie, can I ask you, sometimes um, my patients say, well, how do I find a therapist who does antifibrotic treatment? How do you find a therapist who does that? Oh, that is a golden question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I mean, we don't, we have a little stamp on our forehead right here. So if we walk down the street, you'll recognize us really easily. No, <laughs> uh, I think that, um, I, I think probably for the people that you would want to find someone who's doing some continuing education, because I think that a lot of the antifibrotic treatments that we, myself, Karen and Missy do um, are probably learned after our primary education for lymphedema treatment. So you would want to kind of ask around maybe and find a more experienced therapist. I think that would be great. Um, but no, there isn't necessarily a, a uh, degree or, you know, certification for the antifibrotic stuff. It's really got to be a therapist who's inquisitive and creative and, you know, sees the value in, in lots of different uh, modalities to help patients. This last, um, this conference that I was just at with Missy just last, this last yesterday, actually, this last weekend um, was really all around the use of modalities and how modalities can enhance um, our treatment techniques and our long-term outcomes and our patient's ability to self-manage. So I'm super excited because there hasn't been too many uh, pro uh, programs or seminars focused on the use of modalities. So um, it was one, we had a hundred people there. So now there's a hundred more therapists with a little stamp on their forehead. That Yay. Says they're, they're, they've got I a little- I also want to experience. address that question too, because uh, I just recently gave a talk to for a local health fair with our, our DME in this area for patients and therapists on, on and especially geared for patients on how to find a qualified therapist and questions to ask uh, a therapist when you do, you know, like resources, online resources to find therapists who have their appropriate training and, and the type of questions to ask them. And one of them is to ask them, you know, how much, what kind of continuing education have you done? Do you attend conferences? Do you do, you know, continuing education? Are you using, you know, they just, they have to learn the questions to ask, which I know they don't know the questions to ask unless somebody tells them what questions to ask. So it, it's, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. It's like, okay, what, how do they find a therapist? But then how do they know what questions to ask when they find the therapist? So. That's a really good point. Maybe we should maybe we should write a piece, write that up and put it on the website. That might be a reasonable thing to contribute. That'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. And you know, sometimes you have to think outside the box because 
as Leslie mentioned, this is these are advanced skills. And your typical lymphedema therapist is not going to know how to address fibrosis. It's, it's someone who's interested in learning more. So sometimes you may have to work with a lymphedema therapist who can coordinate with another therapist who is skilled at fibrosis. In an ideal world, you want one and the same. But if you can't find a lymphedema therapist who has those skills, who's not interested in learning them, then uh, I would say search around, and it's most likely going to be a physical therapist, although there are occupational therapists like myself out there who do, you know, treat with modalities, but uh, I would surf the internet and look for practices that advertise that they work with scar tissue or post-surgery, and then make sure that the two therapists talk to each other, because a general physical therapist who doesn't know a thing about lymphedema might be great at scars, but they need to know some of the lymphedema precautions, mm. you know, particularly things like the use of heat um, and so on. So that's just a suggestion because not every community is going to have one therapist who does it all. There was a lot of chat about this very topic and a real hunger for more training. And I think that is something underscored here that is a great jumping off point for further action. We did have one question from an anonymous attendee. What do you think of radiofrequency ablation? I don't think we use that with lymphedema. We use that, isn't that, I think we use that mostly for pain control for, um, but I don't. I, I use rate. I use laser, which is different than radio frequency ablation. So I'm not sure. Karen, do you want to address that at all? I don't. I don't use radio frequency. I don't. Yeah, that's favorite. a medical technique. It's used in yeah. cardiology and vascular surgeons, but um, uh, not really used in clinical lymphedema practice. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. But we, but we do use light therapy. We use cold laser, is what I use, and I know Karen uses it, and Missy uses it too. We use different um, wavelengths of laser to create um, cellular changes. So if I had a perfect world, I would get to see all my patients prior to them having um, their breast cancer treatment. And I think if we were able to anticipate that there's going to be some edema, now notice I didn't write lymphedema yet, anticipate that there's some going to be some edema, some uh, maybe a little fibrosis and some scarring post-op because this is what happens post-operatively. You know, and if we were able to teach them uh, some self-manual lymphatic drainage, which I know all of us lymphedema therapists love to do, and help them start redirecting the areas that are um, pooling or filling up because of changes in their um, anatomy or their lymphatic vessel structure, that would be awesome because these some of these changes, especially the radiation changes, as Missy um, commented on earlier, they can make changes for they say 12 to 18 months, but all of us can probably tell you it's like up to three years and maybe a little beyond. So those changes can be present. And if we could assist that movement of fluid out, it would be awesome. Um, we use different things like like I said before, compression. We use chipped pads. We choose chipped foam pads of different shapes and sizes to um, help. Um, mo modulate or move fluid out of the area. Um, and it may not even be that they need it all the time. Maybe it happens after they clean their basement the first time after they've been had their treatment. But the big thing is that that I think that people need to understand is that it's it's pretty out there that lymphedema doesn't hurt, but I can tell you when it's in the chest wall and the breast, it hurts. And so when I came up with a tagline for my company many years ago, they were saying, you need a tagline. And I said, I don't know what a tagline is because I'm not in marketing. And I said, all I can tell you is that a hug should never hurt because that is the thing that I would hear from my patients. You know, the first patient that really stimulated my extreme interest in this area was a fifth grade teacher. And that fifth grade teacher had all these kids that would run to her, you know, up to her and give her big hugs. And it got to the point that her chest was hurting so bad that she couldn't, she couldn't handle these hugs. You know, her husband would kind of dance around it and try to hug one side or the other side. But truly when you have that chest wall full and painful, a hug should never hurt. It should never hurt anybody, but it should specifically never hurt a breast cancer patient because everybody needs a hug, especially anybody that's been through can cancer. So, you know, those are just some things to consider. So in, in a perfect world, but that doesn't mean that we can't treat it afterwards, after the fact. 
but in my in my um, perfect world, that's what where it would be. Karen, do you have any more perfection you'd like to add to that, or Missy? Well, I I just recently realized that I have the, and I know this term has been around for a while, and I mentioned this to you at the conference about the post mastectomy pain syndrome, mm -hmm. and I had never really stop to consider that and now it's like okay now i'm having pain in this breast and it's like what you know what's the process what's going on and i i contributed to the radiation changes but you know it's it's not something i was expecting but it's there and now it's something that i have to treat so i don't know if karen has something she want to add on that you know, I think that's so true, Missy. And I also think that um, pain can, and swelling for that matter, can be present because of many different factors. And radiation is certainly a big one. Um, you know, chemo, again, can cause um, swelling in the breast and pain, you know, residually. There can be um, nerve injury with surgery or even nerve compression from swelling. And uh, the scar tissue can also affect the nerve and create traction that creates pain. So part of it, I think, is just trying to figure out, okay, well, what, what is the root of this pain? And what can we do physically to change the body so that we can maybe eradicate um, the root cause? Very good, thank you. Is that Sarah. like a chronic regional pain syndrome? Is that in the same kind of family, that kind no. of? No, no, the um, chronic regional pain syndrome is really different from any type of post mastectomy um, uh, pain because uh, Crips is um, it's still a little bit um, mystical and unknown. And uh, I mean, there's many things that can bring that on, but uh, in, in both the upper and the lower body for that matter. But um, that seems to be more um, nerve related then um, uh, I would say that there's more than just nerves involved when we're dealing with um, post-mastectomy pain. I Wouldn't have you say? a CRPS patient uh, that I just, that I've been treating for the last two years with significant CRPS and she didn't even have radiation and she had a mastectomy and no other treatment except a mastectomy and she had tremendous pain and um, she couldn't tolerate a, a bra or a prosthesis. She can barely tolerate a t-shirt. And so the thing that I used for that patient was um, I used a lot of um, elastic taping in the area. And then I did dry needling into her scar areas and her pain is like 90% better. Wow. And laser. And I use laser too. But her pain is like 90% better. And so she'll come in every, now she only comes in every maybe six months or so. And she'll come in and she, she, she kind of measures how her CRPS is doing because CRPS doesn't always just it go away. Sometimes it just rears its little head now and then. And she kind of knows how she's doing by how much tape she has to use. So she'll shorten the tape because when we first put the tape on, it crossed the whole entire chest wall. And now she can get down and she can get it down to like this much tape. It's only this little part of the scar that's sensitized. So, and then sometimes she doesn't need it at all. And she can actually wear a prosthesis and a bra now. So CR, and that's the, that was actually maybe the second CRPS patient that I'd seen following um, breast cancer treatment. It's not it's the most pretty rare. Common. Yeah, it's not common at all. But you got to think out of the box for those people too, as we do. Okay, next slide. So my clinical observations when I'm working with this patient population is that the body is always trying to restore homeostasis, and it's trying to do that with our lymphatics as well. So it's sending the lymphatics in the directions that it can. So we have the ability as lymph therapists to improve the transport capacity, to improve the siphoning effect or the natural siphoning effect that's actually happening through MLD, the MLD that mean we might do some of the modalities, some of the compression or the foams, but also um, by treating, teaching our patients how to do this themselves. And that's, that's a really exciting opportunity. I've had patients that we were waiting to get compression for the upper extremity, teaching them self-lymphatic drainage. And between what I did and they did, their arm went down an inch, you know, in girth, just with using self-MLD. My daughter just broke her hand. She was on a scooter going to the bowling alley and she she's in Boston and she flipped over 
on the sidewalk and her hand swelled up like crazy. And so I said, you got to start doing MLD. So she started doing the upper extremity MLD and her hand swelling went down quite quickly. So we have this incredible opportunity to change swelling or, or to enhance what our body is naturally trying to do. So that's why those patients who can participate in their self-care, they do get better control and they feel better about themselves to have something that they can do. Um, I think that in, in my opinion, in the perfect world, I would love every patient who has breast cancer treatment to wake up in some compression because just like we would treat um, an, you know, an ankle or an amputation of any sort, we would put compression on any of those surgical treatments um, right away and why we wouldn't do that to the breast. I know they give them what they a, a bra of some sort, but I question in all cases if that's really adequate support for those patients afterwards. Um, so I would love them to come out with a good compressive bra that they could actually use on and off for the first year. Um, and I, I think that maybe that would reduce the amount of chronic, that's you know my opinion of course, of chronic edema that these patients have. But giving those patients control is extremely empowering for them. One of our audience members is clamoring for a book. Do you have a book, Leslie? How many times I've been asked to write a book? Yeah. No, I haven't written a book. I don't know. Karen and, and Missy, has, should we write a book? What do you think? Maybe a blog. It would have to be updated every week because I'm always adding new stuff. In our spare time, we need to write a book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we need to write a book. But, you know, again, you know, participating in these continuing education processes like the NLN or even a, a number of the companies out there, whether it's Lymphopress or some of the other companies, they are, I am so grateful to partnership with these companies because they provide the education that we need and, and, and having the opportunity to be an educator with some of these different companies, they're not telling me what to say. You know, they're asking me to help people understand the value of what we do, the new techniques that we use, and then maybe how whatever product they have filters into the total treatment plan of that. And so I am so grateful to Lymphopress to be taking the amount of time and energy to put these monthly um, seminars together for people. So this, and maybe you'll learn a pearl here and then I'll get an email from you and I'll say, hey, Leslie, I need more information or Missy, I wanna know about this or Karen, you're in my area, can you have lunch? You know, so truly those of us that are out there in the world treating, um, we love to talk about it. Love it, love it, love it. So, you know, look for those pearls and then look for the experts in that area and contact them because maybe we know of a, maybe I'm speaking at another seminar sometime soon. And, and that would be something that you could go to. Um, I think that's probably one of our biggest challenges. And for some of the other seminars that are out there, you know, um, lymphedema seminars is a wonderful programming. It does great um, um, education. I, I teach for them. I know Missy's taught for them and Karen Tate teaches for them too. And we're all, they're asking us to constantly come up with new and innovative things. So lymphedema seminars would be something to look into and see. Uh, they're doing some Zoom ones in the future some of the different schools, they have some advanced um, trainings that are out there. So you kind of have to dig around a little bit or call somebody who knows somebody who might know of something that's going on. I think that's the best thing to do. And then, you know, and then Karen and Missy and I will all go to a beach somewhere. We'll write a book soon. Well, if you're going to the beach, you need to bring me as well. Well, someone's got to, someone's got to help us with the wording. So we need to take our marketing person with us. So so Perfect. Anyway. And people are responding in the chat with lymph seminars and how you can connect with that. Really great information. I know also that we are going to be losing you a few minutes before the top of the hour, Leslie. So please take your slides and bring us home. Okay. Well, I don't have too much more to offer. I, I have to leave early because I'm doing another webinar at nine o'clock for a laser company for some therapists in Portland, Oregon. So that's why I'm, that's the only reason I'm having to leave a few minutes early. But um, I just was going to leave you with the last couple of slides here, which are just to remember that, you know, none of this lymphedema treatment stands alone. This does not negate the, the normal rehabilitation that we as therapists know that every patient needs after surgery. And that could be exercise. It can be strengthening. Remember, all those patients come to us 
with some something pre-morbid. I mean, there's none of us are perfect even before we have treatment. You know, some of us um, have a swelling. There's actually a genetic component to people that are swellers out there. So sometimes we don't even know that we're a sweller until something happens and, and that it, it initiates that for us. So, you know, actually, these are just some, just a little smattering of some of the exercises that are good for patients. But I have um, a number of exercises that I love for patients that are great. But I think the biggest thing is being able to um, get the right thing at the right time and to be open to the different um, products that are out there, including the lymphopress products, which I love. I don't even start when I have a patient that comes on comes in with um, arm edema or pretty significant arm edema. Any patient that's probably going to need a bandaging process, I actually in my clinic use a pump beforehand. I use a compression pump pneumatic compression pump. And then if they have fibrosis, I make a special, oh, I know, here I go, Karen Ashworth with my jelly rolls. Anyways, I use a, a, a foam. There's a number of different ones out nowadays, but I actually use a spaghetti foam type of um, long uh, thing that I wrap around their limb and then put their limb into the pump. And what that does is reduce what I call the low hanging fruit. We need to, you know, how many times do you, do you bandage a patient? And then like, Two hours later, it's falling off. That just drives me cuckoo. You know, we, we don't have enough lymphedema therapists as it is. So if I can get some of that fluid out, get down to treat, do the treatment, the fibrosis things that I need to do, and then do some manual lymphatic drainage to make sure that, that the tissues are gliding, that the fluid is moving well, their bandages will stay on longer. And I'm getting patients in garments and like, it depends on the size, but if, if I've got a patient who's somewhere between three and six centimeters larger on that side, especially in an upper extremity, I can usually get them into a garment in two weeks, you know, and that's because I'm treating that low hanging fruit. And that's because I have lymphopress pumps in my clinic and it makes the, the treatment just much more effective and much more efficient. So, and then that gives me a little more time to spend on exercise or a little more time to spend on scar tissue management. So, you know, being proactive about this, which is why I think it's so awesome to get involved with a lymphedema therapist prior to your treatment, you know, even though, and if the lymphedema therapist says, if you see a lymphedema therapist afterwards and she says, or he says, there's nothing wrong with you there. I only need to see you once a month and you can put up your hands and sing hallelujah. You know, that would be great. But if there's something that needs to be addressed, addressing that early on is really important because that patient's going to have edematous events, I call them over the course of the year. And we want to be able to manage those. One of the therapists, I think, I think it's a, sorry, it's just a great idea to get people in to see the therapist before you have your surgery. You know, just like we tell people before they're going to have lipidemia reduction surgery, find a therapist, go in to see them, let them get to know your body. So I, I really appreciate that piece of advice. And just one really quick question, which um, compression garment do you use from Lymphopress in your clinic? Oh, well, I have all of them. <laughs> I'm just I use the I use the, comf sometimes I just use the sleeve. If there's really no trunk part, I'll just use the sleeve. But I like okay. the comfy sleeve and jacket. If I if they have a trunk component, I, I use that. Um, so for that's for the upper extremities, but I have the pants and I have the um, the bod pod and I have single leg things. And so I sort of, I have a whole rack of stuff that I can kind of choose from, but I, for, I would say 99% of the time, I don't even start a bandaging process without doing some sort of pneumatic compression. And here's the thing, the patients love it. And how many of them go on to have to need a compression pump afterwards? Many, but not all of them. Sometimes you can reduce that enough that they don't need that at home, but it gives them a chance to feel what it's like. And they know, they know some, op some other ways to help manage it. So I, I'm a, I'm a big pump user and it's made my life easier. And and I know I probably shouldn't do this, but I have this middle finger right here that's the bane of my existence in terms of pain. And we as lymphedema therapists, when we're trying to do that deeper tissue treatment that's required for the scarring and for the, um, the uh, fibrosis stuff that's going on, sometimes that's really hard on our hands. And I really want you as lymphedema therapists to protect that because I didn't. I didn't for a long time and I've blown the ligaments on sides of my fingers and they're they're really problematic now. So um, that was actually one of the reasons I went into using pumps because my hands just couldn't do the amount of time and deep pressure that was required to treat these patients um, optimally. So I think that, you know, using, using these modalities to help is a real asset. 
So I love that you said that. Leslie Bell, thank you. That is golden and so important. We love working with lymphedema therapists so that patients can continue your hands-on work in the comfort of their home and keep progress moving forward and saving your hands too. So that is awesome. Can I tell you, save your hands. <laughs> yeah. Save your fingers. So, I, anyway. We should take a screenshot of that. And I don't know what we could do in our marketing with that one, but um, Jennifer Merrill is in the audience. She is a certified lymphedema therapist. She asks, is there a therapist network she can join to discuss difficult cases and get ideas? She's in a rural area and she needs to bounce ideas off of others and hear ideas, but doesn't know who she can reach out to. If there isn't a group, can she make one? Does anybody have any advice for Jennifer Merrill? Jennifer, I would suggest that you um, reach out to NLN because they are working a lot with different subspecialty areas and having um, groups on a regular basis. I also know that they are getting a mentoring program in place. So that might be another option for you. And you may wanna reach out to them in terms of just having like a lymphedema therapy support group. I know that Facebook has a lot of groups where therapists help other therapists. So th those are just a few ideas, but also, love, love, love the idea. I would also like to, if you're a physical therapist, the occupational therapist, my occupational therapist friends always wish they could join the American Physical Therapy Association for our oncology section, because we're pretty organized there. So there's actually some really good um, online groups for if you're a physical therapist, um, if you join the oncology section, then you actually have access to our listserv. And it's a pretty active listserv. And I can tell you some pretty heavy hitters, um, research people. Um, we all weigh in on this stuff and make ourselves available to answer questions. And I absolutely agree with you. If you're in a rural setting and if you're maybe a little newer in this, I mean, I don't know what I'd do without Karen Ashforth. She's been my left arm for a long time. And my friend, Missy Bunch, she's awesome. I've been attending conferences with her forever, but I don't know what I'd do without my posse of people. I call it my tribe. So, you know, like that's one of the wonderful things about being at the NLN as I was with my tribe and my tribe just makes me happy. We mm -hmm. talk about things. And I think that having those friends and um, um, professional acquaintances are really important. So again, if you're in the APTA, consider joining the oncology section or, you know, you can call me and I'll help you get into it. That's amazing. I love this. And let's squeeze another question. And this is more about office stuff. How do you as clinicians, as therapists charge when you are using pneumatic compression pumps? Well, I can tell you how I did it and I can tell you how you should do it. How about that? So I had a large private practice with a lot of, um, I had assistants and, and I personally didn't charge people for the pump when they would come in early. I'd have them come in early. We'd do some, you know, I'd have them do some clearance um, and then I'd put them on the pump. And then on my hour that I would spend with them was doing other stuff. I think in retrospect, we shouldn't be giving away that kind of care because that, that pa patients were in my office easily for an hour and 45 minutes, if not a little bit more, depending on how many limbs needed to be bandaged. So in, in hindsight, I would probably be charging patients if they wanted to use a pump because pumps aren't free and your expertise in terms of what they need and how they need it is also not free. Um, but on the other hand, it also reduces the amount of time that you, you have them in the clinic and it reduces your time and frustration as a therapist immensely. So I don't know, I don't know what the right answer is there. Um, I, for years and years and years, just added it into my treatment and I had extra space, so I did it. But I don't think, I don't, in retrospect, it shouldn't be free, but I would treat them, they'd be in my office for an hour and 45 minutes, probably a minimum. There is a CPT code um, 97016, which is vasopneumatic treatment. Um, the only thing is, is that you cannot use that code if you have a complementary pump that is on loan from a vendor. So you would need to actually own the pump. What I do, though, is I don't use that code. I usually, um, if I'm 
doing a, a pump session with a patient, it's usually because I want to see what are the effects on this patient and is this a potential treatment for them at home? I'm yeah. titrating the pressure to see, okay, what's the right dosage that they need? What are the right settings for them? And I'm talking them through the whole thing. So it actually becomes self-care and education. So I will charge for those codes. Another thing you can do, which a lot of therapists do, is they maximize their hands by using the pump on one part of the body while doing treatment on the other. So you can be doing MLD on one leg and using the pump on the other side, um, you know, likewise with the upper body. So there's all sorts of creative ways to, to make it work where it's fair all around. Yeah. And, it, and, and remember that education part is a billable code and it's, it's, and we're educating them anyways. We're always educating our patients. We don't have enough time with them to educate them fully. So, you know, you, you can do two things at the same time. The other thing to that. maybe consider is that using a pump may not be considered skilled therapy. So that's why we have to use it in conjunction with something else that we are doing that's considered to be skilled therapy that does have a code. I know there is a code for reimbursement for a compression pump. I think it's a very, very low reimbursement rate from what I recall. I haven't been in the in the clinic setting in the hospital for a while, but um, I use I do the same thing as as Leslie and Karen. I use it in conjunction while I'm doing the other limb, you know, and switch it back and forth um, to like it's like having an extra pair of hands to to get the work done more quickly, more efficiently. Yeah, well, those are good questions. We are four minutes before the top of the hour, Shell. I just say, let's do some closing remarks here. Okay. That way we can make sure everybody gets to their next appointments. And we want to thank the audience. You've been amazing tonight in chat. We love your questions. We love that you logged on to the live. This will also be posted on the Lympha Press YouTube channel for future reference. But um, any closing thoughts, Missy, that you would like to leave with the audience tonight? Um. I always encourage therapists and patients to become familiar with products, um, especially therapists to become familiar with all their vendors and the products that they offer so they know what they can uh, help their patients get into for you know the, the conditions or the things that they present with. So like if they have truncal edema, you know, what kind of compression broad would be best for that person if they have uh you know just is it just arm swelling is it both you know what what kind of tools are they going to need so it's really important to know where to your, you need your go-to people and and mm -hmm. people you can contact for the things that you need that's so important to have those that relationship with vendors and the contacts to, and and the continuing education absolutely leslie any closing words i know you have to bounce because I've got to go. And I think, I think everybody heard all the words that I can think of right now. I think the my final thoughts are just really tailoring the approach as I've got on my last slide here, tailoring our approach to our patients and, and understanding what their needs are and then making their life better when they're done with us. So thank you very much for having me. I appreciate thank it. you. You made our lives better by being here. And now I'm going to defer to the Karens to close us out. Karen Ashforth. They will come up with awesome words of wisdom. It was really great to see you all tonight. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. So I'm going to springboard from um, what Leslie just said in terms of just having a really well stocked toolbox because being able to offer your patient the right tool for the job. And as Missy said, understanding what tools are out there, knowing your vendors, asking for samples, asking for information and education so that you can really give your patients the best tailored care. Because as lymphedema therapists, we don't do cookie cutter treatment. And fibrosis is definitely something that is very individual. So the, the more you can learn, the more powerful you are going to be able to help your patients. Beautifully said. Dr. Herbst, bring us home. <laughs> well, I want to springboard off of, off of everybody. Um, but I think one of the things that I took home tonight is that it's really important to do your research and find a good therapist in your area that has multiple tools in their toolbox that they can use. 
um, especially anti-fibrotic therapy. And I, I will encourage all the physical therapists, occupational therapists, massage therapists in the audience to do more CMEs and learn more and get more tools because in lymphatic disease, we know there's a lot of inflammation and there's a lot of fibrosis. And you can't just treat, you can't just move lymph. You also have to work on fibrosis and fibrosis can occur very deeply. I've, I've learned a lot tonight. It was such a great time. And I want to thank um, both of our guests, even though we just lost one, but thank you, Missy. Awesome. Thank you all for tuning in to this live edition of the Research Roundtable. We will be back next month. Many of you treat veteran patients. They have particular challenges. We are going to talk about solutions, physical and mentally, and in every way, how you can better care for veteran patients. Um, oftentimes, they end up in your clinic Maybe they're not at the CBOC or the VA hospital. We're going to talk about peripheral arterial disease. We're going to talk about lymphedema. We're going to talk about how Lymphopress can help you and partner with you. So it's Veterans Month next month at the Research Roundtable. Veteran patients, we'd love to have you log on as well. With that, have a wonderful night, everyone. And again, thanks for being here. We appreciate you all so much. See you soon.